Hello, everybody. Welcome. Nice to see you all. So what I want to speak about is the it's my understanding of the meaning of the term coherence to be one with in the context of my understanding of the nature of enlightenment, of the experience of uh, the most profound and high state of consciousness. So this is a, it's a very interesting, and I find thought provoking, intriguing inquiry is what is the nature of coherence to be one with in the context of the awakening to enlightened awareness, which is a spiritual experience. So just to speak in broad generalities, usually the, the experience of enlightened awareness, the awakening to the higher state of consciousness in which we <clears throat> become conscious of enlightened awareness, our awareness becomes awakened with the presence of enlightened awareness. This usually informs our subjective self-sense with the presence of eternity. There's suddenly the presence of a timeless and formless, beginningless and endless, literally eternal ground of being, of existence, of, of, of essential self of reality itself. And in that state of consciousness, the sense of duality of two-ness falls away. So one awakens to a sense of being what we could truly call a cosmic singularity, an absolute singularity. So this singularity has no center and has no boundaries. And that's what's so extraordinary about the state of enlightened awareness. It's suddenly becoming conscious of that which is eternal. And often when, when this state of consciousness is spoken about, we get the sense or the idea that to awaken to enlightened awareness, to become conscious of enlightened awareness, to have the experience of the awakening to enlightened awareness. In that state, we automatically become or experience oneness with the other, the others, the world, and the whole universe. This is what how it is often spoken about that when I awaken to enlightened awareness when I become conscious of consciousness. I experience oneness with the other, the others, the world and the whole universe. And this is presumed to be true more often than not when people are speaking about enlightenment that inherent in the state of enlightenment is the experience of oneness with the other, the others, the world and the whole universe. And uh, I wanted to question this assumption. I want to question whether this is actually really true. That is it true that inherent in the awakening to enlightened awareness is there the presence of oneness or not two-ness or non-duality with the other, the others, the world and the whole universe. Is it possible to experience the presence of eternity and in that in, in, in the in, in the present and in the face of the presence of eternity to be aware of the other, the others, the world and the whole universe. And maybe feel a sense of unity or one is with, but not necessarily actually being at one with. So to repeat what I want to do is I want to inquire into the nature of this experience of enlightened awareness and to question whether inherent in the experience of enlightened awareness is the one is with all of life, all of consciousness, all of the cosmos. So 
I want to try and make an interesting distinction here, which is that um, usually the awakening experience, the awakening to enlightened awareness, is an inner experience that happens within the subjective sense of self and, and seems like it expands to, to, to infinite proportions. So in that state, one feels non-separate from and connected to absolutely everything that exists, seen and unseen, known and unknown. I often like to describe this as a leap from relative cognition, relative consciousness to absolute cognition, and absolute consciousness. So this kind of experience is, as I'm sure you all are very much aware, absolutely life transforming, ultimately exhilarating, completely liberating, heart opening, mind transcending, absolutely transformative. <clears throat> and when people claim to have had this kind of experience in a very profound way and, and claim to be, or appear to be uh, grounded or rooted in this kind of expanded state of unity consciousness. We often find them very compelling. We find their, if they're, if they're the real thing, they, their personality and the expression of their persona usually expresses and transmits that consciousness of eternity, the presence of eternity, the presence of the infinite the presence of the great mystery that the mind can never understand. So we often, if you get to know people who have had or are grounded in this higher state of consciousness or in the experience of this higher state of consciousness, they tend to be a little bit different. If they're for real, their persona expresses a measure of liberation, a measure of transcendence, a measure of inner freedom and a measure of Transcendental knowledge. But then there's the second question comes, and this is, a, this is, this is where all the confusion comes into, into, into being, which is, is there coherence or does there seem to be a measure of coherence or oneness with, does there seem to be a measure of coherence in their relationship to the human experience? So if someone is supposed to be grounded in the awakening to enlightened awareness, how is there, is there some tangible, discernible measure of coherence in relationship to their expanded state, their apparent so-called expanded state of consciousness in his or her relationship with his or her husband or wife, for example? Is there coherence between the state of oneness, the state of trans, trans, transcendental or cosmic consciousness, and the relationship that I would have with my wife, or that, or that enlightened woman would have with her husband? Is there a measure of coherence between our understanding about that state and the kind of relationship that that in particular individual has with his or her nearest and dearest? we would tend to hope so, or imagine that there would be a, an expression or a manifestation of coherence between the, between the higher state of consciousness and the individual seems to have attained and become stabilized in, in their relationship with their husband or their wife or their children. And in the same way, <clears throat> if one has attained a significant measure of stability and enlightened awareness or claims to have done so, is there a measure of coherence in relationship to that, in that individual with their relationship to money? Because the 
experience of cosmic consciousness, of eternity consciousness, of inner freedom is supposed to set us free inwardly, liberate us. That's what everybody says. Enlightened awareness is the source of spiritual liberation. The Buddha called the awakening to enlightened awareness the experience of the deathless, the uncreated and the unborn. Ramana Maharshi called it the self. So does the awakening to the self or the conscious awakening to the deathless, the uncreated and the unborn change our relationship to many dimensions of the reality of being a human being. So in this case, our relationship to money. Is there, what kind of, is there any coherence in the enlightened one in their relationship to money? Is there fear and attachment and greed still present in the enlightenment, in the enlightened one's relationship to money? Or does their relationship to money express a measure of, of, of freedom? Then of course, there's the, there's the very charged question about human sexuality, for example, is there any, if someone is supposed to be grounded in enlightened awareness, the man or woman is supposed to be grounded in enlightened awareness, how does that express itself in their relationship to the very powerful experience of sexual desire? We know this has been a very tricky topic for mostly male spiritual masters over the last 40 years or so. Is there coherence between inner freedom and a relationship to sexuality? This is what I mean by coherence. So the point here is that the that inherent in the experience of enlightened awareness, the powerful experience of enlightened awareness is the awakening to what's called non-duality or oneness with the other, the other, the world and the whole universe. And everybody says, yes, when I had my experience of awakening to enlightened awareness, I experienced oneness with the other, the others, the world and the whole universe. So what does oneness with the other, <clears throat> the other, the world, the others, the world and the whole universe actually look like in real life? What does it look like in relationship to our husbands and our wives and our children? Relationship to money, sex, power. These are important questions. Because part of the point I wanted to make here is that the inner awakening to non-duality or oneness or cosmic consciousness or this absolute singularity doesn't automatically bestow upon us any kind of inherent coherence in relationship to all the dimension, all the complex dimensions of being human. And if what I'm saying is true, and I believe that it is true, in most cases, this is, this is an important subject for inquiry and discussion. If we, this is something we're interested in, if, if enlightenment is something that we're preoccupied with, something we're very consumed by, and something we want to understand and ultimately experience for ourselves, it's important to understand what its limitations are and the work that I think we all need to do if we're serious about that kind of awakening experience. So to continue to expand upon what I've been sharing, I think that there's a, there's, there's a, a myth and that many people seem to believe there's some kind of myth, is the myth in the thinking that if you have a powerful experience of enlightened awareness, everything will become coherent. <laughs> everything in your life will begin to line up most perfectly because now you're in a state of enlightened awareness. So naturally, 
Everything's going to just work out. For everything, everything's going to make sense. Your life will be free from contradictions, and free from any fundamental paradox. Of course, nothing could be farther from the truth. But this is, this is uh, I believe, part of the mythical, unexamined mythical thinking around what happens when people wake up and awaken to enlightened awareness. <clears throat> now, I want to make a distinction between maybe two different kinds of awakening, two different kinds of enlightenment. One kind of enlightenment is the kind I've been describing in which we experience a profound sense of non-duality and oneness with the totality of our experience. This is, this is the awakening to consciousness itself when consciousness becomes aware of consciousness. And consciousness, as we all know, has no boundaries or borders. The subjective experience of consciousness is that it is timeless and formless and beginningless and endless. And if you want to know how I come to that conclusion, <clears throat> all you have to do is look into the nature of your own experience of subjective conscious awareness in this very moment. And if you look into the nature of your own experience of conscious awareness in this very moment, you won't be able to find in this very moment any boundaries, any beginnings and endings. So in this, in the, in, in, the, in the presence of the direct cognition of the limitless nature of consciousness itself, inherent in the subjective experience of the nature of consciousness itself, it feels like there's nothing missing. Everything is there because there are no borders and there's no boundaries. And that seems to be enough. And it is enough as long as we are not interested in the whole notion of relationship. So when we first begin to awaken to enlightened awareness, we realize the ultimate truth about the nature of reality is that there's only one. So if there's only one and not two, there's no such thing as relationship. And this is what my, my teacher and my guru, the great H.W.L. Punjaji, revealed to me is that inherent in the awakening to consciousness is the recognition that there's only one and not two, which means there is no relationship. No relationship is the ultimate truth about the nature of consciousness and the ultimate nature of non-duality. There's no, no relationship whatsoever. It means there's no here and there's no there. There's no here and there's no there, there's no you and there's no me. So there's no notion of relationship. And in no relationship, there's only freedom. And that is a state of consciousness. What I'm describing is a state of consciousness. And no matter how deep and how liberating our experience of that state of consciousness is, sooner or later we're going to need to get up from our seat and go to the toilet, make a cup of coffee, have dinner, or lie down and go to sleep. But the whole factor, fact of relationship, the inescapable fact of relationship and relatedness sooner or later rears its head in the bliss of our conscious experience of non-duality. And, and the minute this whole notion of relationship and relatedness, you and me appears and here and there appears and the complex reality of being a human being suddenly rears its head. And that's when this whole question of coherence enters into the picture. So when we're looking at the nature of consciousness itself on its own by itself, 
outside the conscious, outside the context of relationship. We don't need to think about coherence. But when the reality of being human and the inherent complexity of being human, which involves relatedness and relationship enters the picture, everything changes. And this, it's, it's really this question has been preoccupying me for about 35 years. So, so in these two kinds of enlightenment, I wanted to describe one kind of enlightenment is the awakening to the consciousness of consciousness or non-duality or oneness or eternity. But then there's another kind of enlightenment. And in the second kind of enlightenment, we, we understand that many great realizers who have had the kind of awakening I've described, awaken to an aspiration, a conscious, a conscious inspiration and aspiration to transform the world and ultimately the whole universe into an enlightened paradise, into paradise into utopia. In Tibetan Buddhism, they call it the land of Shambhala, or heaven. So what's, what's interesting to me is is that it seems that, it, it seem, it seems that imbe that's embedded in the awakening to consciousness, it seems to be that embedded in the awakening to enlightened awareness is a subtle or not so subtle, compassionate aspiration and profound inspiration to transform the world of duality into a paradise of not where, where non-duality reigns, to turn the world, and the world is, is this matrix of, is this multidimensional matrix of relatedness, to transform the world of this multidimensional matrix of relatedness into a paradise, into a heaven realm, into the land of Shambhala. This is not a new idea. As I said, many great realizers have awakened to this kind of cosmic inspiration and aspiration. Now, one of the defining features of paradise or heaven or utopia would be a would be the presence the, would be the dramatic presence of overwhelming unavoidable ecstatic and intoxicating coherence so in this in this new world, in this new in this, in this new paradise, in this new heaven realm, suddenly it's very different than the world we're living in right now. I can tell you that everything made sense. Human beings were all human. This, I'm not speaking about the world that we're living in. I'm speaking about the, the land of Shambhala, the paradise to be. It's, it's a place where everything makes sense, where all people are rational and compassionate, kind and generous, where everyone lives for the upliftment of all. Where everybody's awake, everybody has awakened to enlightened awareness and everybody's cooperating with each other at the highest level of human potential. So in this vision of paradise, this vision of heaven on earth, the, the defining feature of the paradise of heaven would be coherence. It would be coherence at all levels in relationship to the, com relationship to the complex challenges of being human. There would be profound coherence between the realization and the recognition of the ultimate truth of, of non-duality or oneness and each and every human being's relationship to 
all the multi all the multi-dimensional challenging aspects of being human. That's coherence. And of course, one of the things that we find so deeply disturbing and deeply troubling by the time we're living in is because there is so much incoherence happening in the world around us and between us on so many different levels at the same time that it is spiritually challenging and spiritually devastating. Just the level of incoherence is, is literally overwhelming. And for many of us, challenges are spiritual idealism. Now, as many of you may know, I'm, I'm very interested in not just non-duality, but an evolutionary non-duality. Non-duality in the context of evolution and becoming. So when we awaken to non-duality in the context of evolutionary becoming, we awaken to a deep, heartfelt yearning for coherence, coherence at higher and higher levels of human potential. And it's a yearning that seems to come from the depths of our soul. It's a yearning that doesn't come from the mind. It's not manufactured by anybody's mind comes from the soul and comes from the self. And it's a yearning for greater, not only for coherence, and for not, only, not only a fundamental level of coherence, but a profound level of coherence and a desire for coherence at higher and higher levels of human potential. So part of the point I've wanted to make in this talk is that coherence is not, inher is not inherent in the awakening to consciousness. In the awakening to consciousness, there is inherent, is in, there is an inherent coherence in consciousness itself, but, that is, that, but that's the nature of consciousness itself. It's not anything that's beyond it. The awakening to consciousness can be an end in itself. It can be the ultimate relief and release from attachment to fear and desire and to ignorance and to unenlightenment. But beyond the attainment of the bliss and the freedom of the conscious of consciousness and the inherent coherence available to us in the consciousness of consciousness, there's another kind of awakening that happens, which is the journey for coherence at higher and higher levels of human potential. And what that means to any given individual is going to be different. Because there's no mythic, God-given, preordained answer to the question of what coherence looks like for all people at all levels of development what coherence would look like and feel like for, for an individual at a certain level of development would, would, would look very different for, for another individual at another level of development. And as someone who, pays, who tries to pay attention to what people are thinking in this particular field, I'm, well, I'm very curious about what, what are the what are those individuals who seem to be the most enlightened and the most sophisticated and the most intelligent and the most awake, what do they think represents these higher levels of coherence or the highest levels of coherence in relationship to these different, to different aspects of being human individually and together. I noticed that uh, there's not a lot of agreement. <laughs> There's not a lot of coherence about the meaning and definition of coherence and our levels of development. So this is a very tricky subject. It's very interesting. 
and to find the answers to the to, to find the answers to these kinds of questions requires that we all be willing to dig very deeply into the nature of our own thoughts and thinking in our own experience of consciousness in our own experience of being human and our own thoughts about consciousness and being human the challenge of being human and our own thoughts about the challenges inherent in human potential and the inherent challenges in actualizing higher human potential within ourselves and with each other and between us. And it requires us to be ruthlessly and brutally honest with ourselves. So I feel that um, At least this is true for myself, and I assume this is true for other people. I can't say so for a fact. <laughs> but I think once we've become, to repeat what I said before, I think once we've become established in a measure of stability and the awakening to enlightened awareness, I don't believe that that, that being established in measure, and stabilized in, in the measure of enlightened awareness is enough to make us truly happier to ultimately liberate us because, because as I explained before, what follows from that is a mysterious aspiration that our life then our life would become an expression of coherence in multiple dimensions at the same time, which is not an easy task, it's a tall order. It's the this aspiration for coherence. I want my life to make sense. I want my life to make the deepest sense. I want my relationship to life to make sense. I want my relationship to life to make the deepest sense. I want my relationship to relationships. I want my relationship to relationships to make sense. I want my relationship to relationships to make the deepest sense. And we all know that this, the challenge of human relationships and relatedness is a difficult area for all of us to manifest deep and profound coherence of love and trust and goodwill, kindness and forgiveness. Integrity. So I think inherent in the awakening to enlightened awareness, it, it, it can bestow upon us this evolutionary thirst, this evolutionary yearning for higher and higher and greater, greater coherence in and as and through the human experience for our own life. And as we get stronger and deeper in our realization, this will become a and an inspired <clears throat> aspiration that the universe could become enlightened. That the universe that we are co-creating could become the land of Shambhala in real time. That the universe that we're co-creating could become the paradise that we all know is possible. And only then, and only then would we be released. Only then would, be, would we be released. Only then would we be released. Because then, it, it, at least it, it seems like then it, it, the job would be done. Now, finally, 
how any one of us would define the nature and meaning of coherence to us personally would depend upon what our values are. We don't all share the same values. We don't all share the same beliefs, conscious and unconscious, about the nature and meaning of reality and nature and meaning of the human experience. But each and every, each and every one of us will, consciously or unconsciously, relate coherence to our conscious and unconsciously cherished values and beliefs. And as we begin to investigate, what are the nature of my values and my cherished beliefs, my deepest opinions about the ultimate meaning and significance of the human experience of life, of consciousness itself and existence itself. As we look, in, as we look inside to discover what our values are, we may find that our values could use some work. <laughs> it may be our values, maybe we might discover that our values are the values which made deep and profound sense to us maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Maybe they need to be updated and refined and reworked, re-examined, maybe improved upon. And as we work on this process of updating and redefining our values, we'll notice that our consciousness seems to be evolving as a result of that, of that kind of process, that kind of spiritual process. We seem to be becoming more conscious and more wise, much deeper and much more capable of understanding than we were 20 or 30 years ago. But as we update our, our values, how we will interpret the meaning of coherence and what coherence looks like will evolve also. As our values change, and as our understanding changes, the meaning of coherence will change at the same time. And this is very interesting. So you can see this is a moving target. This is a moving target for all of us individually and collectively. Because as I said before, there's no divinely preordained definition of coherence. Then it's that already is self-existing. It's up to us to define what these values actually are, what they mean, what they look like, and why they are so important. So the awakening to consciousness and the, con the awakening to the consciousness of consciousness, the awakening to non-duality and to cosmic awareness does not bestow upon us any kind of inherent understanding of coherence. That's my point. So spiritual life, and so the spiritual life lived in earnest, the enlightened life lived in earnest requires hard spiritual work, especially as it, as it relates to this question, especially as it relates to the question of what's the meaning of coherence? And the meaning of coherence, another way, to, another way to describe the meaning of coherence is what's the most perfect, what would, in heaven, in, in, to put it another way, in your notion of heaven, whoever you are, in my notion of heaven or in your notion of heaven or paradise or the land of Shambhala, what would the perfect human relationship look like? How would it be defined? What would the perfect human relationship look like? How would it be defined? 
how do human how do enlightened human beings behave in paradise <laughs> how do enlightened human beings behave in paradise it's a complex question So in my way of thinking, the awakening to enlightened awareness, the awakening to non-duality and the consciousness of consciousness, is just the beginning. The fundamental ground of oneness and not two-ness. The fundamental awakening to the singularity that is all of life. It transcends and includes everything. It's really just the beginning. Because after that, there's so much work that we need to be doing eternally. The longer that I live and the longer that I teach, as many people have said before me, the more I realize how much I don't know and how much work there is to be done in order to find out. So if we, if we, if, if, if a part of our spiritual practice is digging into this question of How do human be, how do enlightened human beings behave in paradise? <laughs> uh, it'll give us a lot to chew on, a lot to work with. Especially if we're looking in the mirror when we ask the question. So remember, coher the, the coherence that we would be striving for, the coherence that we would be striving for would be would be that ultimate attainment where everything would make sense, where everything would make sense. And it would, it would feel so good. It would feel so good and so deeply right. It would feel so right. So absolutely delightful. I guess to put, to put the last point I've been making in mythical, mythic terms, we could say, we could say that the, and this is a mythic statement, so don't take it literally, but you can if you want to, <laughs> that the, we could say that the energy and intelligence that created the universe, and that's creating the universe right now, we can feel through our own spiritual yearning, through our own experience of yearning spiritually, that the energy and intelligence that created the universe and is creating the universe right now aspires for coherence at deeper and deeper levels of complexity. And the deeper the complexity, the harder coherence becomes. Because there's so because there's so many more variables to deal with. But it seems like, it feels like that when we, at least this is my understanding, is that when we're awake, awakening human beings experience this yearning for profound coherence, transpersonal coherence, cosmic coherence. The yearning that life would make deep and profound sense at all levels. That what we're experiencing in those moments it would be a yearning that's coming from the deepest parts of our own self, not stepping from our ego or our conditioned minds or even our souls. It's coming from a deeper and higher place. 
So it seems like, it, at least it feels like, the yearning for coherence is coming from the very source of existence. And I think this yearning for coherence is the best part of each and every one of us when it's been awakened to and liberated and discovered. It means I really, it's really, because it really means, it means I really care about life. It means I realize that I care about life. I care about consciousness. I care about existence. I care about purpose and purposefulness. And I don't, and I don't believe that the yearning I'm describing for coherence just, it just comes from a naive mind or a naive soul. Mature minds and mature souls can also yearn for this greater coherence. And I, and I believe that as long as that we are personally awake to and in touch with this deep yearning for coherence, it means we're gonna keep trying we're gonna keep trying, we'll keep reaching for the highest because we feel compelled to do so, not even for our own sake anymore, but for the sake of the evolution of the interior of the cosmos. <clears throat> and in my understanding, that's the greatest gift we can all give each other. Huh? 